Hello, and welcome to Microsoft SharePoint Online. My name is Sean Bugler, and today we're going to be talking about all the things you're going to need to know to get up and running as either a site owner, a site administrator, or a SharePoint power user. So let's go ahead and get started. In this first module, we'll talk about understanding SharePoint content, including giving you a broad overview of SharePoint structure, including what's being given to you when you create a new SharePoint site. We'll also define the management of SharePoint content. So there's a lot of really cool stuff that we'll be talking about to give you some bird's eye perspectives on what it is that we'll be working with as we get deeper and deeper into SharePoint. Let's talk about SharePoint components. In order to successfully operate within a SharePoint environment, it's important to note all the different tools and components that plug into the overarching hierarchy that is SharePoint. So we'll be talking about a few of those components here in this video. The first component we're going to start out with is the site. The site is the house's foundation. It's the empty box in which stuff can be put in a manner of speaking. It's a collection of interrelated web pages that display stored content. Now, sites themselves don't actually store data. They just present it through the second component, the web page. As mentioned just a moment ago, the web page displays stored content. The site threads all of these web pages together onto a single platform, into a single box. So web pages are the user-facing portion of a SharePoint site. Whenever you visit a SharePoint site, the very first thing you see is a page. Now, neither sites nor pages actually store data. They just present it. So if neither sites nor web pages actually stores data, what does? Well, that brings us to our first SharePoint component that does store data, the list. A SharePoint list is simply a list of data, similar in structure to an Excel spreadsheet. It has rows and column headers, which allow you to organize, sort, even filter content. A great example of this might be a contacts list or a project to-do list. Keep in mind that lists don't always look like that column and row structure, but at its core, the data is stored just like that. It's important to note that data stored within a list is data stored directly within SharePoint. So if you're talking about Word documents or Excel spreadsheets, they wouldn't go into a list. So if neither Word documents nor Excel spreadsheets go into lists, where do those go? Well, that leads us to our second data storage component here in SharePoint. The library. A library is just a mechanism to store content within SharePoint. It's essentially a SharePoint list, but instead of holding the data directly, it holds files that hold data. So this allows us to take Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, PowerPoint presentations, even OneNote notebooks, and store them in SharePoint for real-time collaboration. This means that I'm able to manage my Word documents or facilitate PowerPoint presentations in the web with other people, no matter where they are in the world, as long as they have access to the SharePoint site. So up until this point, you have a site. That site has pages, lists, and libraries. Right now, these are all separate components that haven't really had an opportunity to talk to each other. So in order to take all of this data that's floating around inside of a site and display it on a page, we need two different components. The first is the web part. The web part allows us to take data either within a SharePoint site or outside of a SharePoint site and display it on a SharePoint web page. So it's important to note that web parts can pull both from within and outside of a SharePoint site. And finally, the sixth core component of a SharePoint site, the app part. The app part can only pull data from within a SharePoint app. A SharePoint app generally refers to either lists or libraries or other third-party plugins that can be integrated with a SharePoint site. So to bring it on home, you have a site. That site has pages, lists, and libraries. To display the data from lists and libraries on a web page, you'll need web parts or app parts to display said data. We'll talk about all of these components in a lot more detail as we go throughout this year, but it's important that we introduce these core concepts to you early so that as we start to introduce how to use them, you understand where they plug into the grander scheme. 
go ahead and pause the video, and we'll see you after the break. Now that we've talked about those core components of SharePoint, let's talk about where they plug into the broad site hierarchy of SharePoint. At the top of every SharePoint site, you have what's referred to as a top level site. The top level site is simply that, it's the highest site in an entire site collection environment. A top level site contains all the components of a SharePoint site, including pages, lists, libraries, their own web parts, their own app parts. It's important to note that top level sites also have their own collection of permissions. Now that said, a top level site can easily have a variety of children or subsites. These subsites have their own pages, lists, and libraries, web parts, and app parts. They're self contained representations of their own subject matter. So generally, when you see subsites, they are of different subjects, which necessitated their own collections. So when we talk about sites like this, this could easily be the HR site in a company, and the finance site, the sales site. In all these different instances, it's important to remember that subsites are no different than the top level site, except in where they exist in the site's hierarchy. Now there are some things that are important to understand about the nuance of being a subsite versus a parent site. And we'll tackle much of that here in these videos. But when it comes to the data that they store, sites are self-contained environments. Now this could be as far as it goes, but it doesn't have to be. It's important to note, subsites can have their own subsites within that, which once again have their own collections of pages, lists, and libraries, web parts, and app parts. Subsites, just like the sites above them, are self-contained environments, meaning they store their own data and are largely unaffected by the fact that there is a site above them and even a site above that. Now, permissioning does have some nuance, and when we do get to the conversation on permissions, we'll talk about some of that nuance. But when it comes to the data that they store, sites are alone in that data. Now, all of these components that we've talked about here, the top level site, the team site, the sub site, all of this can easily be contained within what's called a site collection, which is the larger box within a box, in a manner of speaking. The ability to take all of this content, top level site, its subsites, and all the data and permissions contained within, and lump it together. While many organizations will only maintain a single site collection, they are by no means limited to a single site collection. Organizations can have as many site collections as they need. Site collections can have their own top level sites, which then have their own subsites, which then have their own subsites within that. The biggest difference between site collections is permissions. While permissions are generally shared from the top level site down, they are not shared between site collections. So you will not see the same permissioning structure on one site collection as you will on another. They're essentially firewall from each other, allowing each environment to operate autonomously from the other. This can allow for separate admins, management teams, even entirely different structures. So this is a quick introduction into site hierarchy. It's important to note that we'll give you some fun tips and tricks utilizing the URL in order to identify what site collections you might be in, and likewise, within what site or subsite you might be in. With every SharePoint site, there are some variables, some things that'll vary from site to site. The data contained within them, for example, or the way that they set up permissions or even the way that they've organized their navigation. But that said, there are some core, absolute elements of a site that are available no matter what site or SharePoint environment you operate in. We'll talk about some of these here in this video. The first element of a site or collection of elements in a site we'd like to talk about are the basic elements. There are three basic elements of every SharePoint site that you should be aware of when operating here in a SharePoint environment. Here's the SharePoint site that we're currently operating in, Project Central. Every SharePoint site has what's referred to as a home page, meaning that when you navigate to the root URL of a SharePoint site, in this case for me, slash team slash sandbox, that is the home page that reveals itself when the site loads up. The home page is an absolute location, meaning that no matter what, as long as you know the root top level site URL of that particular site, 
the homepage will load. Beyond the homepage, we also have a collection of what are called getting started links. Now, if you're operating in a SharePoint site like this one that's already been built out, your getting started links are a little more hidden. Generally, if you've just created a site, your getting started links will appear at the very top portion of any SharePoint web page. However, if you are in a built out site, or if you'd like to know where to visit them, even if it is a brand new site, simply identify the gear here in the top right corner and give it a click. Having given that gear a click, what you're looking for are the words getting started. Now you may not see all these other options here in the dropdown, but pay that no mind. Instead, simply identify getting started and give it a click. The getting started links are a collection of links that are designed to help you manage or operate within any SharePoint site. In this case here, I see six different getting started links. However, it's important to note that depending on your permissions, you may see as few as two of these. Microsoft is a big believer in, if you can see it, you can do it. So if you don't see all of these, it's often because either your environment doesn't allow for these tools, or you don't have access to the permissions necessary to use them. So these are your getting started links. And finally, with every SharePoint site, not only do we have a homepage and our welcome links, we also have access to a search box, which by default searches just the site we're currently in. However, it's important to note that search can easily be scaled to search all sites you have access to in a SharePoint environment. So those are the three core basic elements of a SharePoint site. Go ahead and pause the video and check out your site to see if you have those basic elements. Identify where they are and become familiar with what getting started links you have access to. The second collection of elements that within a site are the navigational elements. These are core navigational context clues that allow us to identify where we are in SharePoint and how to get around it. So back to this example of Project Central. Some navigational elements you should be aware of. Right out of the gate, we have what's referred to as our top links bar. Our top links bar can be found at, you guessed it, the top of any SharePoint site. It's important to note that this particular site that we're operating in here is an uncustomized SharePoint environment. Now, of course, it has had some color scheme changes tweaked, but that said, everything we're seeing here is out of the box SharePoint. Your organization or your SharePoint environment may have some mild customizations of which the top links bar is almost always a victim. So be mindful that it may not look exactly like this, but nonetheless, the logic and location will remain roughly the same. The top links bar allows us to navigate across external sites. So you'll notice that I'm currently in Project Central, but when I click on Project Red, it takes me into an entirely different site. How do I know? The URL bar tells me. I was in the Sandbox site. I'm now one level deeper in the red site within the Sandbox site. URLs are a great indicator of where you are in a SharePoint environment. So the top links bar allows us to navigate to other SharePoint sites. Clicking on them, allows you to navigate. Now, not all organizations will subscribe to the top links bar being for external only. So be mindful that that can change from organization to organization, but that that is generally considered to be the standard. Beyond the top links bar, on the left-hand side, we have what's called the quick launch bar. The quick launch bar is always found on the left-hand side, and it defaults to showing you only content within this specific site. So we're currently inside the Project Central site, also known as the slash sandbox site. So all the content that we're seeing here by default should be only content from within this particular site. Now, like the top links bar, the quick launch bar can be customized, and we'll talk about that in later videos. Beyond that, at the top portion of the screen, we have our navigation bar. Whereas the top links bar and the quick launch bar were contextually specific dependent on the SharePoint site we happen to be in, the navigation bar at the top portion of the screen doesn't change much, if at all, depending on the site that we happen to be in. The most important things to take away from the navigation bar are on these classic legacy environments in SharePoint that still allow for ribbon tabs. You're still going to see these tabs up at the top portion of the screen, like the page tab, which will give you access to tools to help manage a page. Beyond that, however, you'll also see access to tools like share and follow and edit. Now be careful, as a site admin, sharing a site is no different than granting permissions, something we'll talk about in future videos. The ability to follow a site is no different than bookmarking it, 
The only major difference you're going to notice between the two is that following a site in SharePoint is not dependent on your computer, whereas bookmarks are exclusively tied to your computer. If you have the ability to edit a particular page that you happen to be on, you'll see the edit button. If you don't have permission to edit a page, you may not see the edit button, so be mindful that this is one of those contextual tools we've talked about. And finally, this fourth button here on the far right hand side, the focus on content tool, it's important to be aware of because clicking on it hides the top links bar, the search box, and your quick launch navigation. So be mindful that clicking on that can take away a lot of your contextual navigation tools. Simply clicking on that fourth button again will bring it back. Now, no matter what, when you're working in SharePoint, there are always tools and hooks that allow you to see how you got to where you went. So for example, if I jump into central documents here and I go into the Q1 folder, you'll notice that at the top portion of the screen, a breadcrumb trail is starting to build indicating not just where I am, but where I came from. I came from the central documents library and I'm currently inside the Q1 folder. And if I had happened to jump into another folder within that, you'd see the breadcrumb trail expand. The breadcrumb trail is not just for being able to see where you came from, it's also got a functional purpose. So if you've got a file here that you need to move up a level, simply drag and drop up into the breadcrumb trail, and it'll actually allow you to drop it further back. So those are some standard navigational elements that you'll find no matter where you are in SharePoint. So keep an eye on those. They'll always help you to get back to either where you came from or give you some context as to where you're about to go. Go ahead and pause the video and explore your SharePoint site for those core navigational elements. Remember, the top links bar at the top portion of the screen, the quick launch bar, on the left hand side of the screen, the navigation bar at the top portion of the screen, and finally, the breadcrumb trail, giving you context as to where you are and how you got there. Pause the video and we'll see you after the break. The third and final collection of elements within a SharePoint site are the content elements. Locations where we're going to be able to go to either manage site contents specifically through structure, or managing content through settings and features, or managing content that's been removed via the recycle bin. So we'll talk about those here. First things first, it's important to note that when you first visit a SharePoint site, remember, you're looking at a page. So you're not seeing all the data that's stored within a SharePoint site. And you're certainly not seeing all the structure that exists within a SharePoint site. In order to see all the data and structure in a SharePoint site, and likewise, be able to easily navigate and manage it, you're going to need to get into what's called site contents. To access site contents, simply click on the gear here in the top right hand corner. The gear is without a doubt the most valuable navigation tool that we'll talk about here in this series. It allows you to sidestep bad site design. Or likewise, it allows you to step into a more efficient way of navigating across SharePoint environments. You know where you need to go, now get there. Clicking on the gear in the top right corner will present you with a collection of tools contextually based on what permissions you currently have. So by clicking on that gear, you'll notice we have tools like, who is this shared with? If you have the ability to edit a page, you'll see the ability to edit a page and so on. What we're looking for is site contents. So I'm gonna go ahead and give that a click. Clicking on site contents takes you into what's called the backstage view. This is behind the scenes. All the stuff we're seeing here is generated dynamically by Microsoft. So everything we're seeing here is not anything that can be customized easily out of the box. So down below, of course, we'll see our site contents, all the lists, libraries, and other third-party apps that may be integrated with our SharePoint environment. So this is all the data in this entire site listed in one view. It's also here that I can go to view any subsites or children sites here within this particular environment. You'll see here that I've got three, four different subsites, Project Red, Project Green, Blue, and New Site, which I haven't customized just yet. 
So here in Site Contents, we're seeing everything about the data and structure of this particular SharePoint site. It's important to note that the Site Contents, Contents View, is only showing you lists, libraries, and app-based data for this particular site. So I'm not seeing any data for Project Red, Project Blue, Project Green, or any sites that might be above me either. So that's site contents. You'll also notice that it gives us some dynamic contextual information, including the most active documents in a particular site, how many views we've gotten in the last seven days, a lot of really useful stuff. It's here with Insight Contents that we can actually get into our second and third content elements, the site settings and the recycle bin here in the top right hand corner. Now, just as a reminder, we got here by clicking on the gear here in the top right hand corner and selecting site contents. It's important to note beyond that, clicking on the gear again will also give you access to site settings. The site settings link that we see here in the top right corner of site contents and the site settings that we saw in the gear are one and the same. Site settings contains all of the features and options that allow us to manage this particular site. The tools that we'll see available here are entirely dependent on your permissions. Case in point, if you don't have the ability to manage permissions, you won't even see the users and permissions group. If you don't have permission to manage site features or delete a site, you won't see these options. If you don't have the ability to manage the look and feel, you will not see this section. And even for many of you who are site owners, you may not be site collection administrators, meaning there are entire collections of settings that you may not see that I currently see here. Remember, if you can see it, you can do it. If you can't see it, it means you don't have the appropriate permissions. So site settings is where we go to manage not the structure and content, because that's site content. Instead, we come here to manage the more intangible aspects of sites, like the look and feel or the permissioning. The third and final content element of a SharePoint site is the recycle bin. You've already seen that we can get to the recycle bin by going into site contents. However, it's important to note with most modern sites these days, you can also find the recycle bin linked in the quick launch bar here on the far left hand side. No matter whether you click on it using the left hand side or by going into site contents and clicking on it in the top right, your recycle bin contains all the data that you've deleted here within a particular SharePoint site. It is critical to keep in mind that you will only ever see content that you have deleted. Unless you are a site collection administrator, meaning that you have control over not just this site, but all the sites within a SharePoint environment, you will only ever be able to see content that has been deleted by you. If content is deleted by somebody other than yourself, it's contained within their recycle bin and you'll need to contact either your site administrator or your IT team in order to retrieve that data. You will only ever see content that you yourself have actually deleted within a SharePoint site. So those are the core content elements of a SharePoint site. It's important to know all three of them because they will allow you to either sidestep bad site design or expedite getting from where you are to where you need to be quickly. So to recap, Clicking on the gear was the gateway to all of it. Clicking on the gear allows us to go into site contents or site settings. We saw that within site contents, we could find our recycle bin. Although it's important to note, again, in most modern sites, you can also find it here in the quick launch on the far left hand side. Go ahead and pause the video and explore your SharePoint site for those core content elements. And we'll see you after the break. In this module, we'll talk about creating lists and libraries. If you'll remember, lists and libraries are the two 
primary data-based components of any SharePoint implementation. So it's important that we know how to create them. So we'll talk about creating standard lists in libraries. These out of the box, no specifications, no customizations, lists in libraries. From there, we'll also start to talk about creating custom lists in libraries and what those processes entail. We'll talk about utilizing columns and more importantly, utilizing views effectively. We'll also talk about using list and library web parts within a SharePoint web page. And finally, we'll talk about creating list templates so that when we do create those highly custom lists or libraries, we don't have to go about creating them over and over and over again if we need them. We'll be able to actually templatize the structure and views so as to not have to go down that rabbit hole again. So a lot of really cool stuff to talk about here in module two. Let's go ahead and get started. To create a new list, you'll need to make sure that you have the appropriate permissions before you get started. If you're not sure whether or not you have the appropriate permissions, keep an eye out. If we see buttons here on my screen that are not on your screen, there's a decent chance that you're not being allowed to do certain things by SharePoint permissions. With that having been said, let's jump into it. To start creating a list, you'll need to go ahead and identify the gear up here in the top right hand corner of your SharePoint site. Give it a click. From here, you'll see the option to add an app. In 2013, Microsoft decided they were gonna be cool. So they started to reference both lists and libraries as apps. Although it's important to note that lists and libraries will also be referred to individually as lists and libraries, but anytime they're being referred to together, they'll be referred to as apps collectively. So you could click on add an app right here. You can also go to site contents. And here in site contents, you'll see up at the very top, the option to create something new. In this case, a new list, a new library, or a new app. So two different ways to create that here. We'll go through the add an app portal since that's the classic way. And then in our second video, we'll talk about going through the new list creation portal here in SharePoint Online. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point. Remember, we clicked on the gear and either selected add an app or went to site contents and selected add an app. We'll see you after the break. At the top portion of the screen, you'll see a section called Noteworthy. Now keep in mind, there's nothing actually special about the Noteworthy section. Microsoft has simply taken some of the most common apps, lists and libraries that are built in SharePoint Online, and they've put them up towards the top portion of the screen. You can find all four of these, or for many of you, all three of these, in the Apps You Can Add section down below. Rest assured, there's no special significance to these particular apps up at the top. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a tasks list. I'll go ahead and give that a click and you'll notice a little pop-up window appears. So I'm adding the tasks list and it asks me to create very simply a name. Now, of course you can click on advanced options, but if you do, you'll notice it's still only asking really for a name. Of course, it is also asking for a description. You can use your description to help individuals find this list or likewise this library uh, through search. So descriptions allow you to add more keywords that will help this to bubble up in search if you need to. When it comes to naming your list or your library, it might look fairly straightforward. You'll see it just asks for a name. However, it's not that simple. You see, it's not just asking for the name, it's actually asking for the URL. And that's kind of a big deal. You see, URLs can't be customized later. When you create a list or a library, from that moment on, that URL will always be whatever it was that you typed into this name box right now. So it is important to give careful consideration ahead of time. It's also important to keep in mind character limits. SharePoint implementations, at least standard SharePoint implementations, are limited to 256 character URLs. Meaning that here at the top, you're limited to 256 characters when it comes to establishing content 
in SharePoint. So if you were to create a library or a list name that was my first project list, well, right out of the gate, you're taking up a lot of space in that URL. And that doesn't necessarily leave you or your users a lot of room later to add new content. So be mindful that we wanna be very considerate with regards to how much space we take up when creating these lists and libraries. And so it's with that knowledge in tow that we're gonna share three special rules with you here when it comes to naming content, particularly with regards to lists and libraries. The first is camel case. We'll talk about what that means in just a moment. The second rule is no spaces. Try to avoid spaces between words when naming a list or library. And finally, no special characters. Using these three rules, you can ensure that you will keep your names for lists and libraries succinct and non-space consumptive. So let's talk about what each of these means. No special characters is pretty straightforward. With the exception of the hyphen and the underscore, try really hard to avoid utilizing special characters. There are some ones that you are technically allowed to use, but as a general rule, it's better to be safe than sorry. So let's try to leave them out. The first two rules are actually tied together. So we'll talk about no spaces first. If you've ever looked at a URL, you might have noticed that URLs don't support the space. So for example, you don't go to googlespacenews.com and likewise, you didn't go to myspace.com. Instead, when it comes to how URLs are actually put together, there's actually an interesting scheme utilized to convert spaces into a combination of special characters. So instead of typing the URL, my library, and having that become my space library, that space is converted into what's called a percent 20. Why? Because that's what's used. So if you've ever seen a URL that had all those wacky percents and numbers where you didn't type anything, it's because you put a space in. So where you thought you were giving it one character, you actually gave it three. And that's a really big deal when we're talking about a 256 character limit. So that's where camel casing comes into play. Instead of putting a space and having that space become percent 20, instead, capitalize the first letter of each word. This allows us to easily segment different words when naming, but also doesn't necessitate that we use a space, which would then take up way more space than we anticipated, or wasting another character with a hyphen or an underscore, which admittedly you could do. But with these three rules in place, you can create succinct, non-space conceptive names. So remember, camel case, capitalize the first letter of each word. No spaces, because you'll end up with percent 20s, which take up three characters instead of what you expected, one. And no special characters. While you can use the hyphen and the underscore, generally we would only use them in lieu of a space. So with camel casing, we supersede the need to use those special characters at all. Of course, there may be instances where you will need to use the hyphen and the underscore, so do keep in mind that you have the ability to do so. So with that having been said, I'm gonna go ahead and name this Project Tasks. And I'll click Create. Note that I'm following all the rules, camel casing, no spaces, and certainly no special characters. And I'll click Create. Go ahead and create your tasks list and pause the video. We'll see you after the break. So congratulations, you've made your first list. Pretty easy, right? When you create your list, it'll instantly drop you into that list right after you've clicked create. But if you ever get kicked out of it and you need to get back in, remember, you can find all of your lists and libraries by clicking on the gear in the top right corner and going to site contents. Site Contents contains all of the lists and libraries that are specific to this site. So as I scroll down a little bit here in Site Contents, sure enough, there is my project tasks list that I just created. I'll simply click on it to get back in. In later videos, we'll talk about how to make project tasks more accessible. Now that we're inside the list, it's important to note that remember, we named using 
three very customized rules to ensure that we created a good list. But that said, do bear in mind now that we can go in and actually customize the user facing name. So I don't necessarily want it to be this bunched up project tasks. I only created that so that I would have a nice succinct URL. So now what I want to do is I want to change that name, which means that I'm going to need to get into the list settings. To get into list settings using the ribbon interface, you'll need to go ahead and find the list tab. Remember, out of all the tabs that are available here, the browse tab hides all open tabs. And from there, when you're in a list or a library, the first tab contains item specific or individual actions on a per item basis. The second tab will contain tools that impacts the entire app, either the list or the library. In particular, when you click on the list tab here on the far right hand side, we're looking for list settings. It's here inside of list settings that we would like to change the name. If only there was some conveniently named location where I could go to customize the list name. Oh, well look at that. The list name, description, and navigation. I'll go ahead and click on that to customize the list name. Now you'll notice that the field looks very, very similar to the field that we were in when we were creating this list in the first place. But do bear in mind, we've already made the project tasks list. So we can customize this with no consideration for those three rules we shared earlier, because we're no longer creating the URL. So I'll go ahead and call this the project coffee bean tasks. And why not? I'll even put in a couple of exclamation points. Of course, we still have our navigation, but the part that is here that was not here before is the navigation. We get to specify whether or not a link to this list will appear in the quick launch. That's this section here on the left hand side. You'll notice that project tasks is already in there underneath recent. However, you should never rely on recent as being a depended upon interface for users to navigate because recent is just that recent. So if project coffee bean tasks is no longer a recent item, it won't appear here and users are going to get lost. So for now, I'm going to go ahead and toggle yes and click save. And sure enough, just as if it's always been there, project coffee bean tasks is now part of the quick launch. You'll notice that we've customized the name of the app, but if you take a look at the URL, it still says project tasks. We followed all the rules and so we have a neat, succinct name here in the URL, but we were still able to go in after the fact and customize it for the user. So when it comes to creating lists or libraries, it's a one, two punch. The first punch is naming for the URL. The second punch is going into that app's settings and renaming for the user. Once again, you can always rename the user facing app. Remember, you can always rename the user facing name after you've created the list or library, but you can never change the URL. So be smart and follow the rules. Go ahead and pause the video after having changed your name and we'll see you after the break. So that was creating a list using the classic add an app interface. However, SharePoint Online is the beginning stages of Microsoft redesigning the entire SharePoint experience. So there is a new way to create lists that uses a slightly different interface. So we'll want to talk about that way too. Once again, to add a new list or library or app, we're going to start from the gear up here in the top right hand corner. Having selected the gear, we've already seen the add an app interface. So we're going to jump into site contents this time. Now, if you'll remember, site contents is where we came also to click on new. And in that last example, we clicked add an app here. But this time, we're going to go through it using the new modern interface by clicking on new and list. 
This time, when you click New List, it doesn't give you a pop-up window, it gives you a slide-out pane. It's still asking for just name and description, so you might easily fall into the trap of thinking it's just asking for a name this time. Wrong. It's still asking for the URL. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and follow those same three rules to create a new list, and then again, we'll go back in and rename it after the fact. Remember, one, two, punch. Name for the URL, rename for the user. So we'll go ahead and call this the project proposal names. Once again, note that I followed all the rules. Camel case, I've capitalized the first letter of each word to make it easier to parse when reading. No spaces between any of the words to avoid that nasty percent %20 that'll appear. And no special characters, although I could have used the hyphen or the underscore, it's not necessary, and it would just take up more space. The description, once again, is for helping users find content when searching. So feel free to populate this with common keywords that describe the content that will be in this list or library. You can always add more later. And finally, we get to specify whether or not this will show in site navigation. Now, when we were creating a list using the classic interface, we had to go into settings to customize this. But in the new modern interface, it's an option that we get to decide on immediately. We'll go ahead and say, yeah, sure, we would like project proposal names to be part of the quick launch. And finally, I'm gonna click create. You'll notice almost immediately that the interface for the new modern list is dramatically different. You'll notice, for example, there's no ribbon. There's no browse tab or items tab or list tab. The ribbon, especially in these new modern interfaces, is starting to fade away. So do keep that in mind that this is something you'll absolutely have to know if you're gonna work in SharePoint for the foreseeable future. SharePoint is changing, and this new modern interface is starting to show its hand. Now that said, let's come back to the foundations of creating a list or a library. We've already named for the URL, project proposal names, we would like to rename for the user. Of course, you'll notice there's no tabs, and then certainly there's no list tab for us to get into list settings. So how am I supposed to customize it? Well, we can still get into list settings, but where it is in the new modern interface is slightly different. It's in the gear, up in the top right hand corner. So when you're in a list or a library that uses the new modern interface, which has the profile icon, the site name, no ribbon, you're going to find all those previous list and library settings links in the gear now. And sure enough, there's list settings. So I'll go ahead and give that a click to jump into list settings. Fortunately for you and for me, the modern interface has not changed the settings section of lists and libraries. So the interface is largely the same here. To customize the name, simply go to list name, description, and navigation. Clean up the name and click save. You'll notice that that change has now fixed it here in the quick launch, but it has not impacted the URL. Go ahead and pause the video, and if you haven't already, create your new modern list app. Remember, we went to the gear and site contents. We clicked on new and selected list. We followed all the rules, and then we went into the new list settings gear option and customized the list name to make it more user friendly. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. To create a new library, the process is very similar to creating a list. Nonetheless, we'll go through the motions. First things first, you'll need to make sure that you have the appropriate permissions. Remember, if you can see it, you can do it. And likewise, if you can't see some of the tools that we'll be showing you, that may mean that you don't have the necessary permissions. So you'll wanna check with your site admin if you're not already the site admin to assign yourself the appropriate permissions. First, 
Go ahead and click on the gear in the top right corner. Having given that a click, of course, we're going to go ahead and start from either add an app here in this gear dropdown or by clicking on site contents, clicking on the new dropdown and selecting app. Now remember, we're talking about going through the classic styled interface when creating a library in this particular example. We'll talk about creating the modern style of library in just a moment. So whether you click on the gear and select add an app or go to site contents and click new app, once again, you'll see the same familiar interface we were in just a moment ago. I'm going to go ahead and create a document library. Now remember, if you see document library here and here, rest assured they are one and the same. The noteworthy section is simply bubbling up some of the more popular styles of apps into this dedicated section. You can find all four of them here in apps you can add. So I'll go ahead and click on document library. Just like when creating a list, this pop-up asks for a name. Of course, we know now it's not actually asking for just the name. It's instead asking us for the URL. So remember our one-two punch. Name for the URL, rename for the user. So I'm going to click inside the name field, and I'll go ahead and title this one 2017 Documents. You'll notice I'm following all the same rules. Camel case, no space, no special characters. I am using numbers. I could use a hyphen or an underscore if I want to, but again, if you're only using that to replace the space, it's not necessary. Remember, this is just for the URL. So I'll go ahead and click Create. And there it is, 2017 Documents. Go ahead and pause the video and create your document library using the classic process. Click on the gear, Select Add an App and choose Document Library or go to Site Contents, click on New, select App and choose Document Library. We'll see you after the break. So now that we've created that library, we need to clean up the name. We've named for the URL, but 2017 documents all mushed together isn't necessarily the prettiest thing in the whole wide world. Now you'll notice here even though we created the library using that classic process going through add an app, the interface we've been given here is the modern interface. So no longer will you be able to create libraries that utilize that classic tabbed interface, at least not while using SharePoint Online to create a document library. Rest assured that if you do want the tabs, you can at any point click on return to classic SharePoint here in the bottom left hand corner. To rename this library, we need to get into library settings. But because we don't have the ribbon tabs at the top portion of the screen, how are we supposed to get in? Well, remember, in the new modern interfaces for both lists and libraries, you'll find list and library settings here in the gear. And sure enough, there it is, library settings. You'll notice that library settings looks identical to list settings. Simply click on list name, description, and navigation to rename. I'll go ahead and give it a space. I'll go ahead and add maybe an exclamation point or two, maybe a dollar sign just to illustrate that you can put special characters. And I'll click save. Once again, those three rules don't apply when you're renaming because the URL has already been established. Those naming conventions only exist to help contain us and avoid running into character limit issues. Now we've talked about a couple of different ways to go in and customize the list in libraries. We've talked about creating them. We've talked about creating the classic style of list and the modern style of list. We've now also talked about the ability to create a classic style of library using the process, but that we still get that modern library interface. You've seen that it's been challenging to figure out where your settings will be depending on the style of app you create. If it's a classic style, you'll need to use the tabs. If it's a modern style, you'll need to use the gear. So I want to show you how you can get into the settings of any list or library 
without having to pick and choose based on what style of app you're in. So I'm going to go to Site Contents. Here in Site Contents, of course, you know this is where we'll see all of the lists and libraries for a particular site. But what you might not have noticed is that when you hover over any of these lists and libraries, an ellipses appears on the bottom off to the right. So go ahead and hover over any, any, any list or library, like this 2017 documents library, and click the ellipses, and you'll see settings. Clicking on that will take you to the settings for that specific app. Let me show you another one. I'll go to site contents. I'll find that task list I created earlier. Click on the ellipses. Select settings. And it takes you into the settings for that specific list. So that's a surefire guaranteed way to get into the settings of any list or library even if you don't have the tabs, or even if you can't find the gear dropdown. If you have permission to access a list or library's settings, simply go to Site Contents, find the app, click the ellipses, and select Settings. From there, you can rename, and as we'll see in later videos, do a whole lot more. Go ahead and pause the video. Rename your document library, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So at this stage here, we've seen a lot of different ways to do a lot of different things, but I do wanna tie this conversation off by talking about creating a new library using the modern interface. So we've seen that we can create a library by clicking on new and app. But I also wanna make sure I show you creating a new library using the new library dropdown Instead of giving you that pop-up, just like with the modern list, you get this new Create Document Library slide-out pane. So I'll go ahead and call this one Pending 2017 Documents. Once again, remember, we're not creating the name in as much as we are creating the URL. Name for the URL, rename for the user. I'm going to go ahead and click Create. And there it is. To rename it, click on the gear, go to Library Settings, List Name, Description, and Navigation, and clean it up as you see fit. You'll see that once you get in the habit of naming for the URL and renaming for the user, the process gets a lot more streamlined. You get more comfortable with it. It becomes a habit. So remember, create for the URL, rename for the user. Go ahead and pause the video and create a new document library using the modern interface. Remember, site contents, new document library. We'll see you after the break. Now that we've got lists and libraries created, it's time to talk about not just using them for their standard purposes, but customizing them for our specific organizational needs. You see, every list and library that you create has some default fields called metadata that are provided on a case-by-case -case basis. So for example, when we create a new document library, you get the name of a file, when it was modified, who modified it. When you create a tasks list, you get fields like, what's the name of the task? When is it due? Who is it assigned to? And more. So these metadata fields are great, but they're not necessarily specific to you, your project, or your organization. So we'd like to talk about how we can create custom columns based on our specific needs, custom metadata. Now it is important to note, we're gonna have a deeper conversation about metadata in later videos. This is simply to talk about creating custom columns based on our specific needs here in this one object. We like to call it ad hoc metadata or on the fly. To create an ad hoc metadata column here inside of a list or library's modern interface, simply find the plus icon 
here in the main interface and give it a click. Here, you'll get to see what type of metadata field do you need? Do you need a single line of text? Do you need multiple lines of text? Is it number-based? Is it a person that you need to be able to search your Active Directory for? Is it a date? And more. In this case, we'll go ahead and say a single line of text. And we'll go ahead and say this one will be, is it original? Or better yet, is it copyrighted? We'll click Create. So there you go. Now I have a new metadata field. So when I create a new entry for this list, by clicking New, you can see it's actually asking me that question of, is it copyrighted? We'll go ahead and say, Project Tea Leaf. I don't think so. And I'll click Save. And there you go. So I was able to, based on a specific need for this particular list, I was able to add a new column. I could even go so far as to say, click on the plus icon, person, and we'll call this, whose idea was this? I'll expand the column a little bit here. If you haven't already seen, each of these columns can be expanded and contracted just like they could be in an Excel or access-based interface. So I'll go ahead and click new. And sure enough, there's that new metadata field. Easy. I'll call this one Project Cocoa Bean. Is it copyrighted? Possibly. Maybe by Coca-Cola. Whose idea was this? Great question. It was me. And you'll notice that as I type my name, it becomes a searchable database. Of course, I could have typed anybody else, like my coworker. There it is, so now we've got both of us. And I'll click Save. There you go. Go ahead and pause the video and create a new custom metadata column in your list and join us after the break. Welcome back. So I went ahead and populated this list with a few new items, and I've utilized those new columns that we've just created that added value to the information that I was contributing to this list. So the question of, was it copyrighted, or whose idea was this, weren't questions that we were able to answer before this information was added. So when somebody was adding a new proposal name, they were just typing a name and leaving it at that. But now, as they're adding new proposal names, we're now asking them additional questions like, is it copyrighted? Or whose idea was this? With these columns in place, we actually have a lot more resources at our disposal now for managing and controlling how this actual list looks. For example, what if I only want to see items that are absolutely not copyrighted? So I'm going to click on the drop down next to the column name, is it copyrighted? Just like in Excel, we actually get a filter based on this particular entry. So I can say filter by no. And check it out. Now I'm only seeing objects that are specifically not copyrighted, or at least were told to me as not being copyrighted. To clear a filter, simply click on it again and select clear filters. You'll notice that you can customize even further like sorting, so I can sort from A to Z, or likewise, from Z to A, to invert it. If you click on this dropdown again, you'll also notice that you can manage column settings. For example, maybe you want to move this column off to the right. Maybe you don't want this column to be shown, but you do want that information still collected. You can even go so far as to hide and show multiple columns simultaneously, although we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's say that I want to see all of these proposals, but specifically based on LT05 submissions. And there you go. I was able to sort and filter based on specific parameters. Keep in mind that these aren't permanent. I'm only customizing my specific view at this current time. 
Go ahead and pause the video and try sorting and filtering your list. We'll see you after the break. Now that we've spent some time talking about creating custom metadata, we might not necessarily need to see all this metadata that we're collecting every single time we open up this list. For example, I may not necessarily need to know immediately whether or not it's copyrighted. And while it's great that I see whose idea this was, I might really want to know who actually submitted the idea. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to customize this particular way that I look at the list using some view tools that are made available here in the new modern list and library interface. Keep in mind you do have the ability to customize views in the classic style of list and libraries as well. We'll talk about that in another video. So what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go ahead and click here on the drop down that says all items. By clicking on this here, I can actually say, hey, I like this view. Save it. Right now, it would currently save the sorted part of this. But if I wanted to, I could actually edit this current view even further. By clicking on edit current view, it'll actually take me into an entirely separate interface. For those of you that have taken a previous lesson here within SharePoint, you might have seen this is the same interface that we use to create a custom view inside of the classic style of list or library. So I can use these check marks here on the left hand side to hide and reveal what metadata fields I want shown. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and click cancel. The classic style is great, but let me go ahead and show you the new modern way that we can customize these lists and libraries. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to click on this little filter icon. You'll notice that I can customize based on whose idea this was. Is it copyrighted? I have all these filter tools at my disposal. So let's say that I want to create a view that says whose idea this was, but specifically LT02. And I don't necessarily want to see whether or not it's copyrighted. So I'm going to right click. Yeah, you heard that right. Right click here in the web. You can actually right click on this content and you'll see options here at your disposal. Of course, if you don't want to right click or if you want some of those more simplistic options that we saw just a moment ago, a left click will work just fine. And I'm going to go ahead and underneath column settings, say, hide this column. And on that note beyond that, I'm going to go ahead and click on any other column, go back to column settings and select show hide columns. So I could have gone here right out of the gate, but I did want to make sure I show you, you can hide columns on their own if you need to. Here's created by. So whose idea was this is one thing, but I want to know who created this item, who actually submitted it to this list. Once I've chosen what fields I do and don't want to appear, I'll click apply up here at the top. There it is. And I can see in both of these instances, it was both my idea and I created it. As you start to create more specific views, you might not necessarily want to lose that view. To save a customized view, simply click on all items or whatever the name of your view happens to be here in the top right corner. And select save view. If you take a look next to the words all items, you'll notice there's a little asterisk or star. That star indicates that the default view has changed. And that means that we can actually save it to use this view again later. So I'll click save view and I'll call this the LT02 view. Now, before you finally click save on this here, it's important to note the checkbox down below. Make this a public view. A public view means this is a view that's accessible to everybody who accesses this list or library. If this list view or library view doesn't make sense to other users, maybe it's only specifically for your job role, then you're not going to want to make it a public view. So you'll uncheck that box, which means it's a personal view, a view that only you can access. So again, 
if this is something that can improve the lives of others, make it a public view. But if it's something that was built specifically for your needs and won't benefit others, or at least you don't think it will, keep it as a personal view and click Save. In this case, I'll make it a public view. And sure enough, where it previously said all items, I now see I'm in the LT02 view. Clicking on that dropdown again, you'll see I can go back to the all items view. I can edit the current view to add even more specifications. I can even set this as the new default view. Do keep in mind, you can only set the default view if it is a public view, because you're not just setting the default for you, you're setting the default view for all users who will access this particular list or library. So tread carefully when it comes to setting a default view. You're not just impacting yourself. Go ahead and pause the video and create your own custom view here in this list that already has your custom metadata. Remember, I filtered based on whose idea was this. And then I added a new metadata field that did exist but wasn't visible. And I hid a metadata field that still exists but I didn't need to see persistently, the copyright field. Once I customized all that, I selected Save View and I made it a public view. Go ahead and give that a shot and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Not all lists and not all libraries are part of the modern interface. So it's important that we know how to create additional ad hoc metadata here in these classic interfaces as well. To create a new custom metadata field, you'll need to have access to the ribbon tabs up at the top portion of the screen. In this case, we'll need the list tab because we're in a list. Although bear in mind that if you're in a library, the same actions will be found here in a library tab. Here in that main tab, you'll find a section called Manage Views, where you'll have the option to create a new view, modify an existing view, create a new column, or change the view. You'll see that the interface is a little bit more blocky here because it's a little bit of a more classic style, but bear in mind that the same options that were available in the modern list and library are also available here. In this case, I wanna create a new ad hoc metadata field or custom column. So I'll click create a column. Here it'll ask for a column name. I'll go ahead and say related to project what? Now the same options that we see here are the same options that we saw available here in the modern interface as well. So rest assured you're not getting more or less. Of course, you're not being presented with all of them all at once in the modern list. You'll have to click more options in order to see all of them, but we do have access to all the same options here. In this case, I'll go ahead and choose choice, meaning that I want a drop down menu to choose from as I'm choosing my options. Having selected choice, I'll go ahead and scroll down. Do I want to require that this column contains information? Not necessary. Although if it's important metadata, you might want to consider it. Do I want to enforce unique values? Meaning, how many times should the same answer appear? If the answer is only once, then you'll want to enforce unique values. But especially with a drop-down list, be very careful about that, because if you only give three choices, that means there will only ever be three entries, one for each choice. So be very careful about enforcing unique values if there aren't enough values to go around. We'll go ahead and type in our choices here. Project coffee bean, project tea leaf, project coca bean. As we scroll down, we can choose how we display these choices, including drop down list, radio buttons, which are just these style of buttons that you're looking at right here, and check boxes, which do allow for multiple selections. Both drop down menus and radio buttons don't allow for multiple choices. Is there a chance you haven't considered everything? Should we allow users to fill in their own choice? If so, choose yes. If not, and you want to restrict them to just what's in the box, choose no. Default value. Do you want there to be a default value? If so, choose it here. But otherwise, and as a personal recommendation, I would highly recommend 
not choosing a default value. Many people will consider that default value good enough, which means that you may not necessarily get honest, thought-out answers. Finally, go ahead and click OK. So the process is a little bit more roundabout than it was in the modern interface, but nonetheless, the end result is the same. We now have a new custom column. And if I click on New Task and click Show More, you'll notice that my related project field is available down here at the very bottom. In this case, I'll go ahead and say Conference Call. Assigned to LT03, and I'll go ahead and say related to Project Coffee Bean, and click Save. So there it is. I was able to create that custom metadata field. Just as a quick side note here, to quickly edit one of these classic styles of lists, especially when it comes to editing visible metadata, simply click Edit This List, or go to the List tab and select Quick Edit. Either way, we'll destabilize the page and allow you to make quick changes to each of these fields. See, so I'll say I'm able to rapidly drop down this list and populate the relevant items. When you're done, remember to click Stop Editing This List. It's a common mistake to forget to do so, so make sure you do. And there you go. Go ahead and pause the video and create your own classic custom metadata field here inside one of the more classic styles of lists or libraries. Remember, classic implies the tabbed ribbon interface, whereas the modern style referenced the non-ribbon tabbed interface, which was a little bit more sleek, a little bit more designy and a little bit more flowy with how it presents its options using the slide out pane. We'll see you after the break. Just like with the modern interface, we have the ability to use these columns to sort and filter. So if I click on the related project dropdown, you'll see the same interface. So I can say, I only wanna see items related to Project Coffee Bean, for example. Not only can we use that to sort and filter, but I can also utilize the Save This View link that appears at the top portion of the screen. So let's say for the sake of argument here, I want to filter for Project Coffee Bean. I'll click on the drop down for Due Date, and I'll sort based on ascending or descending. And finally, I'll click Save This View. I'll call this the Project Coffee Bean View. Remember, you can choose between making it public or keeping it personal, so only you have access to it. If you choose public, you can go back in later and set it as the default view. Remember, if you set something as the default view, you're setting it as the default for everyone, whereas personal is only accessible to you and you alone. I'll go ahead and click Save. And there it is. I'm now in the Project Coffee Bean view. At any time, I can go ahead and click on the ellipses to the right and modify this view or create an entirely new one. Modify this view is where you would go to set it as the default or, using those check marks we saw earlier, hide and reveal whichever metadata fields you feel are relevant. Go ahead and pause the video and create a new custom view here in this new classic interface. Welcome back. Creating lists and libraries are great, and even better the ability to customize those lists and libraries by adding custom metadata fields using the ad hoc metadata process that we just talked about, and the ability to create custom views that hide, show, sort, and filter those custom metadata fields, as well as the pre-supplied metadata fields. But creating lists and libraries is only just scratching the surface of what SharePoint is all about. You see, if I were to give somebody a link to the project proposal's name list, 
you might ask the question, what do I do? How do I use this? What are these lists about? And likewise, if I were to give you a link to a document library, you might ask, well, what kind of documents? Do I download them? Do I edit them? How do I edit them? So creating lists in libraries are great, but they don't provide a lot in the way of context, which leads us to the beginning conversation about site pages. So pages are content that exists that allows us to customize on an even deeper level what lists and libraries are for. It's really the heart of SharePoint, the ability to add context to content. So what I'm going to go ahead and do here is I'm going to jump into my site pages library here in site contents. And I'm going to jump into the project info page that I created just a few moments ago. In later videos, we'll talk about how to create pages. For now, let's talk about working with pages that already exist. In particular, let's talk about the ability to add these lists and libraries to pages utilizing web parts and app parts. To edit a page, first, take a look at the top portion of the screen. If it's the classic style of page, you'll have your ribbon tabbed interface. If it's not the classic style, you're not going to see the browse or the page tab. And likewise, you're not going to see edit, follow, or share here in the top right hand corner. In this case, it is a classic style, so we'll go ahead and click edit either here in the top right corner or here in the page tab on the far left hand side or by clicking the gear in the top right corner and selecting edit page. Any of those will do the trick. We'll talk in a lot more detail about customizing a page. For now, what we're going to go ahead and do is say here at the top portion of the screen, we would like to see all of our project tasks that we created in the project coffee bean tasks list earlier here on this page. To insert a list or library onto a page, you'll need to go into the insert tab. Here in the insert tab, you'll notice two options at your disposal the app part and the web part. App parts, if you might remember, lists and libraries are uniformly referred to as apps. So app parts are exclusively focused on content that is already in SharePoint, namely lists and libraries. Web parts, on the other hand, can pull content not only from within SharePoint, but they can also extract content from outside of SharePoint in the web, hence the name web part. So a web part can do everything that an app part can do. An app part is a much more focused version of a web part. It's exclusively focused on content that's already here within SharePoint. So if I click on web part here, you'll notice there's a variety of different categories, one of which happens to be apps. And here within apps, you'll see all the different apps, the lists and libraries that are already available here in this site. Now look carefully here. In particular, take a good look at the parts section. And when I click on app part, what do you notice? Does the parts section look the same? It should. All the app part has done is hide the categories column. App part, web part, app part, web part. So web parts are the more powerful of the two, but if all you need is just to pluck a list and library and display it on a page, all you need is an app part. In this case, I'm going to go ahead and choose my project coffee bean tasks. From there, I'm going to place my cursor where I would like that tasks list to appear. And I'm going to click add. And there it is. There's my tasks list. But not only can I present this tasks list, but now I can give it a description as to why these tasks are here. Below, you'll find the tasks that are currently active here in Project Coffee Bean. To filter for your tasks, 
click the drop down arrow next to assigned to and select your name. To add a new task, click new task. So we'll go ahead and leave it at that. I'll make it a little bit bigger. And I'll go ahead and jazz this up a little bit. Maybe make assigned to a little bit more eye popping and likewise for new task. Go ahead and put bullets. There we go. So there you have it. I was able to take a task list and add it here to this main page. And then I was able to add context to explain why is this content here. Of course, I could have also gone and customized the text layout. You'll notice everything is in one giant column right now. But if I had click on text layout and selected two columns, I can actually now take this Project Coffee Beans tasks list and move it off to the right. So it's kind of cool to see how flexible this can be. We'll go ahead and keep things in one column. So go ahead and pause the video and try this out for yourself. Remember, first things first, you're going to need to edit the page, either by going to the page tab, clicking on edit, where it currently says save, or by clicking on the gear and selecting edit page. Then go to the insert tab and select app part knowing full well you could use app part as well, or forgive me, web part as well. No matter which one you choose, select the app you'd like to insert, click where you'd like to place it, and select add. And finally, add a little bit of context. Explain why that's there. And when all is said and done, either go back to the page tab and click save, or click save here in the top right hand corner to get out of the edit page view. Go ahead and pause the video and give it a shot. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. The process of creating a web part or app part that includes a library is identical, but for the sake of the video, we'll go ahead and go through the motions one more time. Remember, to edit a page on a classic styled, tabbed, ribbon-based interfaced page, Simply go to the page tab and click edit or click edit here in the top right corner or click on the gear and select edit page. All three are acceptable options. However you choose to do it, once the page is in an edit interface, you can customize it as much as you need, including text layout. Remember, text layout controls what the actual frame of the page will be. In this case, I've now chosen the two column interface. And I'll go ahead and type out a quick description. On the right, you'll find the latest documents related to Project Coffee Bean. To upload a document, simply drag and drop over the folder icons. We'll go ahead and leave it at that. Make it a little bit bigger. And once again, I'm gonna go ahead and place my cursor where I would like to insert that web part. And I'll jump into the insert tab. Just as a quick reminder, you can use either app part or web part when pulling data from a list or a library. A web part is simply a more powerful version of an app part. Web part has categories. App part is exclusively focused on the app category. So in this instance, since we did app part last time, I'll do web part. I'll make sure I'm in the apps category and I will select the pending 2017 documents. I'll place my cursor where I would like it to appear and I'll click add. And there you go. It's that easy. So one last time, insert tab, app part or web part, select the app you'd like to put in to the page, 
place your cursor where you would like that app to appear, click Add, and finally, click Save here in the top left-hand corner, or Save up at the top right portion of the screen. Go ahead and pause the video and try inserting a web part or app part for a library, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So congratulations. You've built a list, you've built a library, you've added custom metadata fields, you've even created a new view or two. Now that we've talked about all of that and you've done a lot of hard work, you might not wanna go through the motions of doing all that hard work again in the event that you need a list and library that may be either exactly the same or very similar to this particular list or library you've already created. Why reinvent the wheel? I get a ton of questions that are, can I copy a list or a library? Technically you can, but there's a better way. If this is a particular style of list or library that you're gonna be creating frequently, it might be in your best interest to templatize it or turn it into a template that you can then apply over and over and over again as you need new lists or new libraries. We'll use the example of the tasks list since we've already created some custom metadata fields like related project. To create a template of a list or a library, you'll need to get into that list or library's settings. If you're in the classic view, that means going to the second tab and jumping into list or library settings. But remember, you can always get into a list or library settings from site contents. Simply find the list or library you'd like to jump into and then click the ellipses and go straight into settings from there. No matter how you get into settings and whether it's a list or a library, the process is the same. Here inside the permissions and management column, what you're looking for is save list as template. So I'll go ahead and give that a click. The first thing it's gonna ask for is a file name. Bear in mind that the file name is not the actual template name. So be sure to give this something descriptive, but also not necessarily anything that you're worried might not be user-friendly enough. Try to stick with some naming conventions. For example, I might call this task list project, indicating the focus as well as the app that is the foundation. For template name, however, I might say standard project task list. You'll notice that I went for something a bit more descriptive, but also a little less user-friendly for the file name. And for the template name, I've decided to go a little bit more broad. I might even decide to call this company standard project task list. With template description, I'll say provides custom columns based on standard company procedure. Now the most important decision you can possibly make when it comes to templatizing a list or a library is whether or not you choose to include content. If you say yes, include content, that means that all items in a list or all files in a library are going to come with this particular app. Now that may sound like a great idea initially, but keep in mind that most of the items in a list or most of the items in a library are generally very specific based on how you're currently using that list or library. And if those focuses change, you may not necessarily want to include content because that would mean building the list or building the library, and then in a separate instance, deleting all that newly created content that you didn't actually need. In this example, I'm gonna choose not to include content. One final note before we click OK. Item security. Permissions. Permissions are not saved within a list and library when templatizing. So if you do choose to include content, that means that any files that may have had specialized permissions will not have those specialized permissions in the template. Of course, that doesn't matter for us because we're not including content. We'll go ahead and click OK. Now bear in mind, this may take a moment, so don't click the OK button a second time. You can always look at the top portion of the screen to figure out whether or not things are loading or if you didn't click the button in the first place. But nonetheless, give it a solid minute or two before you try to click OK again. If the operation is completed successfully, you should get a screen that looks like this, 
saying the operation is completed successfully. It even tells you where you can go to view all of your list and library templates, the list template gallery. In this case, however, we're going to go ahead and click OK. Go ahead and pause the video and get as far as this. Remember, find a list or library that you've already implemented some customizations on. Then, go to that list and library's setting and go to Save List as Template. Give it a good name and click OK. We'll see you after the break. Now that the list or library has been turned into a template, the real question is, where do we go to use it? Well, we go through the same motions that we went through to create a standard list and library all the way at the beginning of this series. We're going to start by clicking on the gear and going to add an app or going to site contents, clicking on the new dropdown and selecting app. You do not want to choose document library or list when it comes to creating a new list or library that is based on a template. You'll need to go through the app portal. Now we've been in this screen before, but previously we just chose from the ones that were provided here at the top. This time, however, we're going to scroll down a little bit. You'll notice that there are a variety of different options at our disposal, combinations of both lists and libraries. A word to the wise, libraries can always be identified by their folder icon here in this interface. All libraries have that folder icon. Anything that doesn't have that folder icon, like these, is a list. So it's an easy way to, at a glance, determine whether or not something is a list, which means that it'll contain individual items that you will contribute one by one, or libraries, which will contain folders and files. So I'm going to go ahead and scroll down a little bit, and I'm actually going to jump into the next page using the arrow to the right. And sure enough, there's my company standard project task list. Now, admittedly, I could have searched for it using the find an app box at the top. But in this case, I wanted to make sure that I found it here among all the other lists and libraries that already exist. I'll simply click now to create a task list based on that template. Once again, it's asking me for a name. Be sure to follow the naming conventions. In this case, I'll call this one tea leaf tasks and click create. I'll go ahead and scroll down here in my site contents view. There's my tea leaf tasks. And check it out. It's got all my custom metadata. There's my related project dropdown. How cool is that? I'll go ahead and create a new task. Task name will be Get Bagels. Do today. Assign to me. And I'll go ahead and click Show More. Related Project, Project Tea Leaf. And I'll click Save. Now, I didn't go and rename this list in library. Of course, to remind you to do that, if it's in a tabbed-based interface, you'd simply go to List and List Settings, or through Site Contents to get into List or Library Settings. But the part I wanted to emphasize here is look how easy it was based on just having to build a list once or a library once, save it as a template, and anytime I need a list or library that is remotely similar or shares the same metadata or is of the same focus, I can now go and create this new list template. So to recap, to create a new list or library based on a template that you've already saved, you're going to go to add an app or site contents and add an app. Scroll through the items in the app portal until you find the one that is your template. Select it and create it just like you would any other list or library. Not bad. Go ahead and pause the video. Try it out for yourself. Build a list or library based on a template. We'll see you after the break. In Module 3, 
we'll talk about managing content in existing lists and libraries. Whereas in module two, our focus was on creating those lists and libraries that didn't already exist, module three is about taking those lists and libraries to the next level, utilizing some incredibly powerful content management tools, including using content approval. We'll talk about what content approval is and how we can take advantage of it. Managing versions. Every file that you upload can be logged and tracked for changes. So we can actually revert back to past versions if we don't necessarily like the changes that have taken place. Of course, that may or may not be on by default. We'll show you how to check. We'll discuss check-in and check-out. We'll even talk about how to force check-out, if need be. We'll discuss the ability to send content to other document libraries. So you've uploaded a file into one location or multiple files into a location, and you'd like to move it to another existing document library. We'll discuss. And finally, we'll talk about configuring expiration policies, because some content may not necessarily need to be there forever. So based on certain parameters, we can actually choose files to expire and remove themselves as time progresses. We'll talk about all this and more here in module three. So let's go ahead and get started. Our first subject here in module three is going to be discussing content approval. The ability for anybody to upload content and have it be instantly accessible by anyone else who also has access to that list and library is great. But that said, being instantly accessible isn't necessarily always in an organization's best interest. Sometimes content that appears in specified areas carries with it a level of weight or importance that shouldn't necessarily just be applied willy-nilly. We might want the ability to vet that content. For example, here we are in pending 2017 documents. We might not necessarily want anybody who uploads a file to have that file just instantly appear for everyone else. So how do we vet that kind of process? Well, we could have somebody whose full-time job is to stare at this library, and if somebody uploads a file, instantly vet it, read the whole thing, and if it's good, leave it alone, and if it's not good, delete it. Does that sound like fun, or productive, or efficient? Hopefully that's rhetorical. Instead, what we'd like to do is when we upload a file to this particular document library, we would like it to go into a pending review state where only the person who uploads it and a select other group of people who have approval content permissions will be able to see it. Let's talk about how to turn that on. So first, let me go ahead and upload a file that already exists on this computer. Or better yet, I'm gonna go ahead and create a new one. So I'll create a quick Word document that is important data. And I'll go ahead and jazz up some quick gibberish here. There we go. And from there, I'll go ahead and get back into that document library by clicking on the name of the site here in the top left-hand corner. So you'll see I was able to create that new document here in this document library with relative ease. But now that file's visible to everybody. There was no vetting, there was no approval, it just is. So what I'd like to do now is I'm gonna go ahead and click on the gear in the top right-hand corner and I'm gonna to go to library settings. To turn on content approval for either lists or libraries, you'll need to get into the list or library settings. Just as a quick reminder, you could have also gone to site contents, found that list or library, clicked on the ellipses to the right of it, and gone into settings from there. List and library settings interfaces are identical. So, We'll talk about it using libraries as an example, but you should note that you can use this exact same procedure to turn on content approval for either lists or libraries. Here inside of the general settings column, we're looking for versioning settings. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on versioning settings here. 
Now, versioning settings are nearly identical between lists and libraries. Libraries have a couple more options, but largely everything is intact. The only one we're gonna focus on for now is content approval. Do you want to require content approval for submitted items? We'll go ahead and say yes. Make sure to click okay down here at the bottom. And just like that, content approval has now been turned on. If I click on the breadcrumb trail here at the top portion of the screen to get back into my document library, you'll notice that there's an entirely new column here that was not there before, approval status. And it's got the approved moniker. Existing files that have already been uploaded or added to a list or library are grandfathered in and they are presumed to have already been approved. Go ahead and pause the video, and in your list or library, go ahead and turn on content approval. Now that we've turned content approval on, it's time to add another document to this document library. So I'll go through the same motions I did before. New, Word document, I'll go ahead and title this one, even more important data, Just a little bit of text here. There we go. And finally, I'll go ahead and jump back into the site. So a key distinction to be made here. Now, instead of it just being accessible, it's now in a pending state, meaning that there's a very limited subset of people who can actually see this content is pending. So right now, I can see it because I created it, I uploaded it. But the only other people who can see it are people who have approval permissions, meaning the people who have the ability to say, yes, this is good, or no, this is not good. Anybody who is not a site owner or site admin cannot see this item at all. They can only see important data. Why? Because it's the only one that's been approved to approve an item that is currently pending. Click on the ellipses to the right-hand side of any file. Or right-click on that file. The right-click gives you the same options that the ellipses did. From there, go to More and select Approve Reject. From here, you get to choose between Approved meaning this item becomes visible to everyone, rejected, meaning that it remains invisible to all except those with approval permissions and those who have uploaded it, or leave it as pending. In any of these instances, you can add comments, which will explain to the user why it's still pending, why it's rejected, or to explain to other admins why you might have approved it. In this case, I'll click Approved and click OK. And just like that, this file is now approved, meaning it's completely visible to everyone who has, at a minimum, read access to this library, whereas that was not the case before. Go ahead and pause the video. With content approval on, go ahead and submit a new item and approve it. Some final notes about content approval. When content approval is turned on, you actually have access to new views that were not available before, including the Approve Reject Items view and the My Submissions view, which filters out for just content that you've submitted. Approve Reject is particularly useful for site admins. It allows you to see what content is still pending approval and what content has already been approved. If you were to turn off content approval while an item is pending, it is de facto approved. Meaning that if I were to go into the library settings for this particular app and turn off content approval, meaning I no longer wanted to say yes or no to make it visible, anything that was still pending, a yes, would instantly get it and it would become visible. So do be careful with that. 
With that having been said, I'm gonna go ahead and turn off content approval, just to give us one last chance to go through the motions of where content approval settings are. Again, go into your list or library settings. If you're in the modern interface, you can find that from the gear, list, or library settings. But you can also go to site contents, find that list or library, click the ellipses, and select settings. From here, we went to versioning settings. And we managed the options at the top portion of the screen, content approval. Require content approval for submitted items. We'll go ahead and say, not anymore. You'll notice it even warns you, after disabling content approval, pending and rejected items may appear in public views. They will. And we'll click OK. And finally, we'll lock it in. So go ahead and pause the video and familiarize yourself with the process of turning off content approval. You might note there's no longer a content approval column anymore. We'll see you after the break. Before SharePoint, when we wanted to share a file with somebody, we had to generally email it to them or put it into a shared network drive. That often caused a variety of different challenges. One of the biggest ones tended to be as we started to go back and forth with a document, even if it's just one person, the number of different copies of that file continued to get bigger and harder to find the latest version. And do I have the latest version? No, you have the latest version. So versioning has always been at the heart of some of our biggest challenges, both in the physical world and the digital world. But it's often been because we didn't have access to the same file at the same time. Well, with SharePoint, we finally put that to bed. When you upload any file into SharePoint, you have the ability to track its version history. To check whether or not version history is turned on in a list or a library, you'll need to get into your list or library settings. So I'll go ahead and click on the gear here in the top right corner, and I'm gonna select library settings. Likewise, however, if you were in a list, you would go to list settings. You can also go to site contents. And once again, select the object like the library and go to settings from there. Now, believe it or not, if you've watched the previous video on content approval, we've already seen where versioning settings are in the versioning settings section of any list or library. So here in versioning settings, we'll see the options down below. Just below content approval, we see document version history. Although to be clear, lists also have version history. Theirs is just a little less option filled. When it comes to tracking the history of a document, there are actually two different ways to track it. Major versioning, which is version one, version two, version three, this is a much more standard implementation. It happens behind the scenes, so users often don't know that it's taking place. Major and minor versions, however, tracks versions not just on a 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 system like major does, but it also tracks the minors, the drafts, the iterative changes, 0.1, 0.2, 0.3. Major and minor is generally only used when there is a collaborative behind the scenes process taking place that requires lots of people's input before a document can be made publicly visible. By default, minor versions or draft versions are visible to everybody. However, if you do choose major and minor, you can actually specify only users who can edit items can see those draft changes. So a great example of this might be an HR department. We're working on a sick policy together. We don't want to publish it, make it publicly visible to anybody who's not in HR until we're done with it. So we'll set major and minor and say only users who can edit items can see draft items. So we can make all the changes we need while everybody on the outside only sees the last major version. And then when we're ready, we'll promote it 
to a major version, and then everyone who has read access to the library can see that content. However, version history at its core is generally used as a backup solution. So major versions in most implementations is going to be more than sufficient. In this example, we'll go ahead and use major versions. Down below, you get to specify how many major versions do you want to keep. Most SharePoint online implementations will have major versions turned on by default, and they will track up to 500 major versions, which means 500 substantive changes. In this example, if I were to delete that number and uncheck that box, it would track major versions indefinitely. In this example, let's say for the sake of argument, I want to track the last 10 major versions. I'm gonna go ahead and click okay. Go ahead and pause the video and turn on or double check to make sure that it's on major versioning in your document library or in your list. Remember, we went into the list or library settings and we went to versioning settings and we selected major versions. If you're in a list, it'll simply say, create versions of a list item, yes or no. You'll choose yes and click okay. We'll see you after the break. With versioning turned on, I can go into any of these files and make changes confident that if these changes go bad or if they're not necessarily what the team collectively decides is necessary, we can revert back to past versions of it, like this coffee budget. So I'll go ahead and click on coffee budget here. And I'm gonna go ahead and edit this workbook. I'll go ahead and select that. And you know, I actually didn't spend $4.50 on coffee on Saturday. I spent $2.50 except for the third week where I spent $11. It was a good cup of coffee. So I went ahead and made some changes. And I'll jump back by going to Project Central, the name of my site. Having just made that change, I've established a new version. Versions are established when the following four actions take place. Open, edit, save, and close. You need all four in order to establish a version. Open the file, edit the file. If you're editing online, saving takes place automatically. So that can't be what determines the version. Otherwise you'd have 400 versions before you closed out any one file. So it's only once you save and close that a new version is established. So let's go find out where that version just got stored. To access past versions of a file, you have two options. You can either click on the ellipses next to any file or right click on it and select version history or utilizing the check mark on the left hand side, select the file, click on the ellipses in the top right and select version history. Either one will work. So you'll see quite a few versions have taken place since we uploaded this file. At any point, I can choose to actually view what that version looks like. I'm gonna go ahead and click on version 1.0, the original uploaded version. And I'll click OK. This will actually open up a read-only copy of that file here on my computer. And I can see here, the original uploaded file had no content. If you take a look at the top portion of the screen, it even describes this as the backup version. So let's go ahead and take a look at version 3.0. So here's version 3.0 and I can see the early vestiges of what this file became. I added the weeks, I hadn't put a chart in and I hadn't updated Saturday. In this instance, I'm gonna go ahead and check out version 5.0, the version just before that file I just made changes to. And sure enough, you'll see there's the chart, there's 450 across the board. 
and I can even go so far as to click Enable Editing. Here in this view, I'm still looking at a read-only copy, but even when I'm reading it, I can actually choose to restore this version and make it the default version. So this is me saying, I don't necessarily like the changes that took place since this version. And I can click restore. Or if I know that version 6.0 made changes I didn't like, I can simply click on the drop down arrow to the right of any version and select restore. You are about to replace the current version with the selected version. I'll click OK. And version 5.0 gets duplicated and becomes version 7.0, thereby tracking all changes, even the ones I didn't necessarily agree with. Not bad. Go ahead and pause the video, make some changes to files in your Lister library, and then revert back to a past version of that item. If I were to go ahead and click on this file now, I would see the original 450, not the changes I made previously. We'll see you after the break. To close out our conversation on version history, we've seen that major versioning does a pretty sufficient job at tracking changes in a document. I do want to remind you that the exact same process works for list items as well. Simply go into list settings, versioning settings, and turn on version history. While document libraries in SharePoint Online have version history turned on by default, Lists do not have that luxury, so you'll have to remember to go check. You should always go check, however. I mentioned major and minor just a few moments ago, but I do want to make sure I show you what the process looks like if you do have both major and minor versioning turned on. So we've made some changes to this document here, the coffee budget. So I'll go ahead and click on the ellipses here and go to version history. You'll notice that I've made some iterative changes. Where I was on version 7.0, I'm now in 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. The big distinction between major and minor, once again, is in the environments where you choose to set it. You can decide that draft versions, meaning minor, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, are not visible to anybody who doesn't have edit access to this library. So right now, we could make the assumption that only people who have edit access to this document library can see these changes. For everybody else who only has read access, the current published major version, 7.0, is the last version they can see. So let's say that we've made enough changes, we've decided that 7.3 is the one. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to make version 7.3 actually version 8.0. To do so, to promote a minor version to a major version, click on the ellipses and go to more. What we're looking for is publish. So in this case here, once again, go ahead and click on the ellipses for the file that contains the minor version you'd like to promote, go to more and select publish, meaning make this a major version. Add any comments that determine why you're promoting it to a major version. Looks good. And click publish. And now, if I go into version history, you'll notice what was version 7.3 has become version 8.0, thereby tracking not just all major changes, but allowing us to track iterative minor changes as well. Now again, if your only goal is to track past versions of a document to revert back to them if need be, major versions is sufficient. However, if this is a collaborative library that contains content that when in progress across all of your team members could not or should not be visible, then then major and minor might make sense. But otherwise, major for the most part, it works. Go ahead and give that a shot. And finally, go ahead and turn versioning back to major if you haven't already. By going to versioning settings, create major versions, and clicking OK. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back.
Just because you upload an object into a list or a library doesn't necessarily mean that it has to stay there. In particular, when it comes to working with files and libraries, we might need the ability to move content from library to library. The problem is, if you download a file and then upload it into another library, you lose a lot of the metadata that makes this file great, whether it's past versions or specified metadata that you've already custom added in. So in those instances, it might be nice to, within SharePoint, move files from one location to another. Now keep in mind, you can't move a file from a library into a list. Remember, lists hold data directly. Libraries hold files that hold data. So what we're gonna need to do is we're going to need to have another library at our disposal in order to move this file. In this case, I'd like to move the coffee budget file that I've been working so hard on, and I'd like to move it to the central documents document library. Now, when you select a file and you click on the ellipses up at the top portion of the screen, you'll see the options to move to or copy to. Move to, of course, says I want to move it and I don't want it to be here anymore. Copy to, on the other hand, says I would like to make a duplicate copy of this file. Do bear in mind, however, that copied files are not linked in any way. They do become two separate files, so if you make changes to one, you're only making changes to just that one. So keep that in mind. Additionally, if you're gonna be moving files from one entire library to another entire library, you can't just move it. You have to copy it. This is a common mistake that people make in SharePoint. You cannot move files to an entirely separate library. You can only copy them to. Of course, from then you can delete the source file if you need to. This is just to ensure that data doesn't get corrupted in the transfer process. So in this example, what I'd like to do is I'm gonna go ahead and select coffee budget and important data. You'll notice that when I select multiple files, the number of contextual tools up at the top portion of the screen dwindles to include download, delete, move to, and copy to. There's not a lot you can do with multiple files selected. Fortunately for us, however, move to and copy to are what we're looking at. To copy a file to a new document library, simply select copy to. From here, it'll allow you to choose a destination, either the current library you're already in, this is useful if you're trying to manage files across multiple folders, you can even move it directly to your OneDrive. Just as a quick side note, the move to copy to feature is also what you would use to move files from your OneDrive for business, if you have it, into SharePoint without having to download and re-upload. But in this instance, I'm also gonna go ahead and jump a little bit further and say, all right, the library I need is in Project Central. Having selected Project Central, I'll see all the document libraries for Project Central, including my 2017 documents, my Central Documents library, and the library I'm currently in, pending 2017 documents. In this case, I'm gonna send it to Central Documents. If there are already folders existent within this library, I can choose folders from here. I can also create new folders if I need to. In this example, I don't wanna put it into any one particular folder just yet. So I'm gonna go ahead and click copy here. And just like that, if you take a look in the top right corner of this library, it'll actually view a status report of whether or not these files are being copied and if not, why not? Before I go into central documents to see if those files successfully transferred, I do wanna make sure I point out, if you had selected move to instead of copy to, you would not have been given the option to choose another document library, only another folder within this one library. So a key distinction to make there. So I'm gonna go ahead and jump into central documents. And sure enough, there's my coffee budget and important data. But more important than just the ability to take files from one library to the next, if I go into version history for any of these files, you'll notice that the version history is no longer intact. So it's important to note that while we have duplicated it here, it is a new file unto itself. Go ahead and pause the video and try sending files from one library to another. Just as a quick reminder, we were not able to use the copy to feature. The copy to feature only allows us to move files 
Just as a quick reminder, we were not able to use the move to tool. The move to tool only allows us to manage files within this particular library. It was the copy to tool that allowed us to move multiple files, or just the one, across not just this site, but other sites and our OneDrive. We'll see you after the break. As SharePoint gets utilized more and more within an organization or a project or a team, the onus becomes even greater to manage, maintain, and curate the content that is inside document libraries to make sure that content stays relevant, stays fresh. One of the most fundamental ways that you can do so is utilizing a library or folder-based expiration policy or retention policy. To set a retention policy on a library by library or folder by folder basis, you'll need access to your library settings. Before we do that, I'm gonna go ahead and create a quick folder called this week reports. And then I'm gonna go ahead and jump into library settings, which we can get to by either clicking on the gear and going to library settings or by going to site contents, finding the library we'd like to set this retention policy on, and going to settings. Here inside of any document library settings, we're looking for information management policy settings. Give that a click to jump in. So it's here that we're actually going to define how SharePoint processes information and what our policies are regarding it. In particular, our focus is going to be on retention. Now SharePoint defaults to what are called content types when it comes to managing files. Content types are the broad descriptor that defines what type of file it is that you're uploading to a library. Now with a standard document library, the only two content types are documents and folders, meaning any document that you upload or any file that you create would have a retention policy. But that might be a bit too broad. If this is your only document library, you might want a little bit more focus on which folder or which library would you like to enforce this retention. So what we're gonna do is we're actually gonna change the source for our retention moving it from content types to, once the page loads here, library and folders, meaning that we can either establish policy on the entire library, or we can specify individual folders within a library to assign retention. Keep in mind that if you are assigning library and folder-based retention schedules, all content type retention schedules are completely ignored. So if there's a site-wide retention policy for content types, it's important to note that this overrides that and that may go against company policy. So be sure to check with your site retention or information retention leaders to make sure that you're not stepping on any toes here. I'll go ahead and click OK. Now that we've specified library and folders, we get to go ahead and assign a retention stage. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on add a retention stage. Once you click on add a retention stage, this is where we get to define based on what criteria will this file be terminated. A great example is based on when it's created, how long should we wait? But you can also say from the last time it's modified. So how about the last time a file is modified plus let's say two months. So if a file hasn't been touched in two months, we might reasonably assume this file is no longer in action. But what do we do once it meets that condition of date last modified plus two months? Well, we can move it to the recycle bin. We can also choose to move it to another location, start a workflow. We can even start to trim the fat. So if there are a ton of previous drafts or a ton of previous versions, we can actually purge all of that. In this example, we'll say transfer to another location. In this case, you will have to define an actual location to receive this content. So what we'll do instead is we'll choose move to recycle bin. And finally, we'll click OK. So what we've done now is we've said when it's been 
more than two months since its last modified date, move to the recycle bin. Keep in mind you can stack retention stages. For example, if before we move it to the recycle bin, from the time it's been modified, plus perhaps one month, what we'd like to do is not move to the recycle bin, we're already doing that. But how about delete all previous versions? So we'll say after a month, if it hasn't been touched at all, we can reasonably assume this document is dead and we don't need the past versions. And we'll click OK. So at this stage, hopefully you're starting to see that we can assign retention policy, but it doesn't just have to be about whether or not we retain it, but how we retain it. Do we move it to a new location? Do we delete it? Do we delete unnecessary information hiding behind it? Do we run a workflow? However you choose to do it, once you've got your retention stages in place, you've got to remember to click Apply. And finally, OK. So to recap on what we did, we went into Library Settings. We dove into Information Management Policy Settings. We changed the source from content type policies to a library-based retention schedule, meaning we wanted to specify on a library basis or on a specific folders basis what kind of retention we wanted to maintain. Once we did that, we established the retention stages by clicking on Add a Retention Stage, and finally, we clicked Apply. Go ahead and pause the video and give that a shot. We'll see you after the break. As a final note regarding library-based retention schedules, we talked about the ability to set retention stages for the entire library. If you did, however, want to be even more specific, let's say you don't want broad retention on the main interface, but just in a specific folder within a library, utilizing the menu on the left-hand side, you can specify specific folders and click on them. Now by default, folders inherit retention schedules from their parent library or folder. But we can also say, actually, don't expire items in this folder. Everything in this folder is protected and no longer touched by that retention policy. However, we can also create our own retention policies. So in this example, it will also ignore the parent library or folder, but it'll also allow us to say, not that, this. So just to kind of bring it on home, the ability to manage retention exists at the library level and at the folder level when you change the source to library and folder based retention. Go ahead and pause the video and we'll see you after the break. Module four, configuring workflows. In this module, we'll talk about what workflows are, why they're so important and how powerful can they be. From there, we'll spin out into using the default workflows provided here in SharePoint Online. We'll talk about actually creating workflow instances, so initializing workflows and what the process looks like. And finally, we'll talk about the new workflow app called Flow, introduced by Microsoft in late 2016. This is considered to be the new successor to what workflows used to be here in SharePoint Online. We'll go ahead and talk about all this and more here in Module 4. Let's go ahead and get started. Welcome back. So let's talk workflows. Workflows are without a doubt one of the most romanticized concepts in SharePoint, and they are powerful, but it's important to understand what they do. Workflows automate a series of steps that would otherwise have to have been done manually in order to accomplish an action. Workflows can be used for any number of different things. If an object is uploaded, then send an email and ask for approval or if a file hasn't been touched in two months, send an email to the person who uploaded it, asking them if they still want it. If they don't say anything, then delete it. Or something as simple as, if I upload a file, then notify this person that this file has been uploaded, and then change the status to notify it. 
So there's a lot of really cool ways that workflows can be put to work, but it's important to know what their limitations are and perhaps more importantly, how to put one together and know what it looks like when it's running. So we're gonna talk about setting up a workflow here in this document library. In this case, this is the project proposals library. You'll notice right out of the gate that approval status has already been turned on. So content approval is in effect. We're gonna do a really simple workflow called an approval workflow, where when a file is uploaded and it triggers a pending status, then notify a designated person who will then receive an email that they need to approve this pending content. To create a workflow that is assigned to a list or a library, go to the library settings or likewise to list settings. Once you get into the list or library settings, what you're looking for is workflow settings. Once in workflow settings, you're gonna see a couple of different options. One, if there are already any workflows affiliated with this list or library, you'll see them here. You can also go here to add a new workflow, which is exactly what we're gonna do. So go ahead and click add a workflow. Out of the box, Microsoft provides up to four different workflows, all developed back in SharePoint 2010. Now that said, you're only seeing two of them out of the box. Disposition approval, which is that retention one we talked about just a moment ago, and three state, which will update a designated column of metadata as this document goes through a process. What we don't see is the approval workflows. To activate approval workflows, you'll need to find the button down below that says you have not enabled approval workflows and click activate. Once you've clicked the activate button, you'll notice that now the collect signatures, collect feedback, and approval workflows are all now visible. So we actually have five working in our favor here. It is important to note, however, that these are all SharePoint 2010 workflow templates. SharePoint 2010 is the last major version of SharePoint where Microsoft provided default workflow templates. Meaning that if you're watching this video in 2017, it's been almost seven years since Microsoft has provided updated workflow templates. So that does mean that there are some not necessarily user-friendly features that you'll notice throughout this here. So we'll talk about those and then we'll talk about the new modern solution flow. So hang in there with us here. Before we go any further, go ahead and pause the video and get as far as this. So go into your document library or list, go to list or library settings and select workflow settings and add a workflow. Make sure to activate the approval workflows by clicking the activate button that we saw down below. And join us here. We'll see you after the break. Now that we've activated all the appropriate workflows, we're gonna choose the approval workflow template. If you're not sure what any of these templates do, or if you're curious about other ones, check the description. Routes a document for approval. Approvers can approve or reject the document, reassign the task or request changes to the document. So all of these are processes and steps that have already been provided in the workflow template. You can build your own classic Microsoft SharePoint workflow utilizing a tool called SharePoint Designer. We don't get into it in that, this particular class, but it's something that if you're interested in building some of these classic workflows, that you can do so in much greater detail utilizing the SharePoint Designer tool. So we're gonna go ahead and enter a unique name for this workflow. Now a unique name not, doesn't necessarily mean go crazy with it, but it does mean when you're looking for this workflow later, how are you gonna know this workflow is what you think it is? So we're gonna call this the project proposal approval. Now every workflow needs a task list and a history list. If you already have a task list that's been created for this, you can select it from the dropdown. Otherwise, notice in parentheses, it says new, meaning that this workflow will go ahead and create those lists for you. So if you already have this selected and it says new, go ahead and leave it be. You'll need these for other workflows down the road anyways. As you scroll down, start options. 
allow this workflow to be manually started by an authenticated user with edit item permissions. So in this case here, we're saying that anyone who has edit permissions can start the workflow. We might also say, however, actually we wanna make sure that only people who have the ability to manage list permissions are able to start the workflow. So if you wanna make sure that only site admins and site owners have the ability to trigger a workflow, you can toggle this. In this case, however, we want anybody who uploads a document to trigger the workflow. Creating a new item will start this workflow. We're gonna say yes. We're also gonna say, if you change an item, that'll start this workflow as well. We'll go ahead and click next. Now that we've gone ahead and done that, go ahead and pause the video and join us here. So remember, we've created a name. We've also made sure that we are not limiting this workflow trigger to people that have managed permissions. We're saying anybody who has the edit permissions will be able to trigger this workflow. And likewise, that creating or editing an item in this object will trigger the workflow. Go ahead and pause the video and get to that point, and we'll see you after the break. Welcome back. It's time to build out the approval workflow. So right at the top portion of the screen, we have to designate who are the approvers. So these are people that have to already have the permission to approve pending content. You can't just assign somebody to be an approver if they don't have the ability to approve content. We're gonna go ahead and assign this to me, LT02. Now keep in mind, you can type the individual name here and then use the check names tool, or you can click on the address book to browse the people and groups within your organization. Now you can have more than just one approver. This is called a serial style, where one person approves it, then another person approves it, then another. But you can also do a parallel approver, meaning that everyone will receive this simultaneously and they'll all need to approve it in order for it to move to the next group. In this case, we're gonna keep it simple. A single person will receive a notification that they need to approve content. Remember, if you were going to add a new stage, you would simply click add a new stage and add a new person. If you do choose to assign it to a group instead of an individual, so in this example, I assigned it to a person. But if you add, for the sake of argument, assigned it to an entire group of people, instead of assigning it to that group, it would assign a task to each individual member. In this example, because we're not using a group, this one doesn't have much bearing on us. But if we had, it's important to note that you do want to keep this checked because otherwise, someone will have to sign in as the group owner in order to actually accomplish that task. In the request, we'll go ahead and leave a simple message. A new document has been submitted or edited and is pending approval. Please review and act accordingly. Now in this case here, due date for all tasks, you do want to be careful with this one here because if you do click on this and pick a date, it's going to choose an absolute date which we may not necessarily want. So instead of assigning a explicit due date for all tasks, what we'll do instead is we'll set an explicit duration per task of one day. How do I know it's one day? Well, I typed the number one and the duration units allow me to designate how long until the task is due. Do I wanna say one day or one week or one month? Now, when a workflow is triggered, you might wanna be copied on it for the first couple of rounds just to make sure it goes through all right. But likewise, you might also want your supervisor to note that there is a workflow in action. Now, the bottom three are the final three that we'll need in order to set this approval workflow. Automatically reject the document if it's rejected by any participant. So back up to the top here, if we had assigned this to, let's say five people, if any of them say no, with this checked, it'll instantly be rejected. It won't go any further. And that's generally how we want it. But let's say for the sake of argument, we've sent it to five people and we wanna make sure that everybody has a chance to approve or reject it before we end the workflow. By default, that's how it goes. 
In this example, however, we'll say end on first rejection. Down below, end on document change. So if a document is edited while the workflow is in progress, meaning that it's pending approval, the workflow will cancel itself out and it'll restart the process based on our prior checkbox that we made the screen before. If you'll remember, we said trigger workflow if the document is edited. So we will also do that, automatically reject the document if it's changed before the workflow is completed. And finally, enable content approval. Well, this is the whole point of the workflow. We want to update the approval status after the workflow is completed. So we'll go ahead and use this to update content approval. And finally, we're gonna go ahead and click save. Before I do, to recap, we've assigned it to ourselves for this example. We've made sure to provide the appropriate message. We've said we want this to be due one day after it's assigned. We wanna reject it if anybody rejects it. We wanna reject it if anybody tries to change it while the file is being processed. And finally, if everything goes according to plan and everybody says yes, update the approval status to approved. So we'll go ahead and click save. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point and click save. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So now that we've got this workflow put together, it's time to actually kick it into gear. To trigger a workflow, in this case, the only thing we need to do is add a new item. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm gonna go ahead and click on new Word document and we'll go through the same motions we went through just a moment ago. I'll go ahead and give this a cool title like Project Thunder. I'll add a little bit of gibberish here and I'll go ahead and click to go back to the site. Remember, anything you create online is saved instantly. Now there's Project Thunder, it's been added, and of course, as expected with content approval set on, it's in the pending state, meaning that only I can see it in addition to anybody who has the approval permissions. That said, there is a new column, the Project Proposal Approval Workflow column, indicating that this workflow is currently in progress. Now that this is kicked into gear, in just a few moments, I'm actually gonna receive an email notification letting me know that a task has been assigned to me. If you'll remember, that workflow assigns a task to whomever we put into that top box. So let's go ahead and check. And there it is. You'll see here that a task has been assigned to me. It says, please approve document. And down at the bottom, it actually gives me the instructions on how to process this. So click here to review Project Thunder, so I'll go ahead and give that a click. It'll actually open that document here in my computer. Now, of course, it may ask you to sign in the first time or two that you try this. Rest assured, as soon as you sign in with your appropriate credentials, uh, it'll learn that it's you and you won't have to go through the motions on this every single time. So I'll go ahead and sign in here. What it's doing here is it's actually downloading a local copy here. Check it out. Not only am I able to read it here, but it's actually indicating that this is a workflow-based task. So I can even go ahead and click open this task at the top portion of my screen in order to approve it. Now, a quick word to the wise, remember, don't click edit document. Why? Well, if you'll remember when we were setting up this workflow, we said if the document is edited, reject the item. So if you didn't want that to happen, we shouldn't have checked that box. In this case, our only job is to review this. I don't speak Latin, so I'm gonna assume it's good. And I'm gonna click on open this task. Although I do wanna make sure I point out, you could have also clicked open this task from Outlook at the top portion of the email. So I'll go ahead and click on open this task. It's gonna open it up in a separate tab and it's going to give me my fields where I can add any comments if I'd like. But finally, I can approve, reject, cancel this task, I can request a change, I can even reassign this task to somebody else if this is not my purview. In this case, I'm gonna go ahead and click approve. And just like that, the task is in the process of being updated. So we'll go ahead and let it do its thing for a split second here. There it is. And finally, all I have to do now is go ahead and jump back into the web browser. Currently pending, I refresh the page. 
And there it is. It's been approved. So we went through the motions of an approval workflow. How cool was that? Now keep in mind that if we had more stages set in, once I approved it, someone else would have gotten a notification and they would have had to approve it and so on and so forth. So rest assured that this can be as simple or as complex as your organization calls for. The most important thing to remember was knowing who to assign it to, knowing to go through the motions of opening that task through Outlook or through Word in that particular example, and finally approving it. Go ahead and pause the video and try it out for yourself. The approval workflow, powerful, requires a little bit of know-how, but powerful. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. So we spent a lot of time talking about legacy workflows or the classic style of workflows. And in particular, we've had a predominant focus on the built-in templates that Microsoft has provided since 2010. That said, you would think that over the last seven years or eight years or however long it's been when you watch these videos, that they wouldn't have just stopped in 2010. And certainly that wasn't the case. But that said, workflows as we know them in SharePoint have changed dramatically with the introduction of this new tool that we're gonna talk about here, Flow. So as the name might imply, Flow is designed to supplant the more traditional workflows. But that said, Flow is an incredibly powerful platform that does leaps and bounds more than what workflows have ever done before. And so we're gonna talk about that here. Now, before we go any further, uh, it's important to note that Flow is something that an organization can choose to make available or alternatively to not make available. So if you visit flow.microsoft.com and sign in with your Office 365 credentials, you'll be able to determine whether or not you have access to this particular app out of the Office 365 platform. So go ahead and do that now. Go ahead and join me in visiting flow.microsoft.com. So Flow integrates with a variety of different platforms and services. In order to see all the different services that Flow interacts with, simply click on the services link up at the top portion of the screen. Having clicked on that, you'll see all the different platforms that Flow interfaces with. Of course, you'll see SharePoint and OneDrive for Business. But you'll also see platforms that Microsoft doesn't own, like Dropbox or Salesforce. You can have it plug in directly to a SQL Server. As you scroll down, you'll see even more, including Box, DocuSign, Facebook even. The list goes on. So don't think for a moment that Flow is just about SharePoint. That's our focus here in this video, but it is just the tip of the iceberg. So please give it a look and see what interests you, what it interfaces with that might be valuable. Flow is very similar to another web-based platform known as If This Then That. If This Then That is yet another platform that does something very similar to what Flow is doing. It's simply Microsoft's version of. Of course, the big thing that Flow has against If This Then That is SharePoint support. So you can go ahead and skim through all the different services here, but you can also view pre-built templates. So we'll go ahead and click on templates at the top portion of the screen. Here you'll see all sorts of different templates that are already made available, and you'll see some ones that look a little familiar, like send a customized email when a new list item is added. Send an approval email when a new item is added. When an item in a SharePoint list is modified, send an email. So these are just some that we're seeing here that are built specifically with SharePoint in mind. But in order to see the ones that are directly related to SharePoint, simply click on Services and click on SharePoint. This will show you all the pre-built SharePoint templates and not just ones made by Microsoft, although you'll see that there are quite a few made by Microsoft. As you'll scroll down, you'll see that they even provide ones that are created by other individuals, like when an existing list item is modified, update a SQL row, or save updates from Facebook to a SharePoint list. So there are a lot of really cool things that interact with SharePoint that aren't necessarily made by Microsoft. In this example, we'll do something simple. When an item in a list is modified, send an email. I'll go ahead and give that a click to use that template. 
To be clear, you don't have to use a template. You can easily go to my flows and create from blank. So you can easily do that. Templates are just a good way to get started if you've never used flow before. So we'll go ahead and do that. When an item in a SharePoint list is modified, send an email. When you choose a template, or likewise, when you try to build from scratch at all, you'll need to authorize different components access to Flow. And you'll also need to allow Flow to talk to them. So in order to engage this with SharePoint, sign in is required. So I'll go ahead and click on sign in. And there it is. Rest assured, if it does take a moment, that's completely normal. So give it a second to think. If it does connect to the wrong SharePoint site, be sure to click switch account or view permissions if you're having connectivity issues. And likewise, we're gonna do the same thing for Office 365 Outlook. Click sign in and wait patiently. Go ahead and get to that point here, having selected the when an item in a SharePoint list is modified, send an email template, and then sign in to both accounts in order to use this template. We'll see you after the break. Welcome back. Let's go ahead and click continue. So one of the first things it's gonna ask here is when an existing item is modified. Of course, it's gonna ask what the name of the site is that contains that list. Fortunately, you don't have to memorize URLs. Simply click the drop down arrow and it'll show you a list of sites that you've interacted with recently sites that you have access to. So as I scroll down here, I see, I don't actually see the URL I need, and that may happen from time to time. In that instance, what you're gonna go ahead and do is simply jump back to the name of the site URL that you're interacting with. In this case, mine is slash teams slash sandbox. I'll go ahead and paste the URL there. Next, here in list name, I'll go ahead and click the drop down. Do these objects look familiar? I sure hope so. These are the lists and libraries we've been working with. What I'd like to do is go ahead and find the, ba -ba -ba, here we go, project proposal names list. So when an existing item is modified out of any of these items, I'd like to send an email. Well, to who? Well, you can send an email to whoever created that item. So let's say for the sake of argument here, if I created that item and someone else edits it, I might want to receive an email. But you might even go so far as to say the job title of the person who created it. So this is particularly valuable if that information is already stored in the Active Directory. While I might have been the one to create this entry, if I've moved on to new things, I don't want to receive that email. But I might want and likewise, the person who has superseded me into that job role might want that email, even though they didn't build this workflow. So I could say created by job title and it'll email that job title. But I can even go so far and utilize pretty much any field that I see fit. In this example, I won't choose any dynamic content, which is what this is called, utilizing existent metadata. Instead, I'm gonna go ahead and say email, this guy right here. And that's it. That's all there is to it in this particular example. So when an item is modified in this list, email this individual, there we go. So now that I've got that up and running, I'm gonna go ahead and click create flow. You'll notice that building a workflow is a lot more convoluted than building a flow. Flows are a lot more user-friendly, they're a lot more dynamic, and they're a lot more expansive in what they can interact with. Go ahead and pause the video and get to this point here. Put yourself in the to field. And we'll see you after the break. I'm gonna go ahead and click Create Flow. Now remember, you can edit this flow at any point by going to My Flows. So there it is. You can see here it was last modified seven whole seconds ago. Well, it's time to see if it actually works. I'm gonna go ahead and jump back into my project central site and there's my project proposals names list. 
Now remember, this workflow doesn't trigger when I add a new item. It only triggers when I edit an existing one. So let's say for the sake of argument here, I'm going to go ahead and right click on this object and select edit. I'll go ahead and say project hungry caterpillar is now project full butterfly. And I'll click save. So I've now edited that particular item in this list, which meets the parameters of the flow we just created. If I were to go ahead and jump back into my manage your flows tab here and click on the I, you'll notice that it hasn't run just yet, or at least it doesn't seem to have run just yet. The real question, however, is what was the end result when it runs? It was receiving an email. So let's go ahead and check my mail. Nothing yet. We'll go ahead and pause the video as this flow progresses. Keep in mind, it may not be instantaneous. So hang tight. We'll see you in just a split second. Welcome back. So it's been about two, three minutes since the flow condition was met, meaning we edited an item in the SharePoint list. So we're going to go ahead and give it another check here. Remember, to check to see whether or not a flow is run, simply click on the little I here in My Flows. Check it out. We can actually see that the flow successfully ran, not just that it ran, but that it succeeded in running. It started about 47 seconds ago, and it lasted zero seconds, meaning it was really quick and easy. And sure enough, check it out. There's an email. The item was modified at that time right there. Kind of cool. Now this is a really simple example of a flow, but it does allow us to see a couple of different things. One, this is interfacing with content in a way that we haven't seen before, at least not with workflows. Two, it's a lot more user-friendly than workflows historically have been. And three, it's a lot easier to manage on a grand scheme. So if I were to go even further into this here, I can actually now edit that flow if I need to, to add more components to it. For example, this email that it sent, item project full butterfly was modified. Well, that doesn't seem really descriptive. So what I'd like to do is edit the send email component. So I'll click on the ellipses. And I can see here that I can actually add more content to this. I can delete this component, add a new component if I need to. But if I want to edit this particular one, I can actually just give it a left click. And you'll see here, this is all the content that was being pulled in order to build this email. You might not have noticed how contextually relevant this was. The item name here was modified by who modified it. And all that content was also made available here in the body of the email. But I can even click on show advanced options and specify who it's from, copy somebody else, add an attachment from somebody's library. So it's pretty incredible what's possible here inside of Flow. But even something as simple as going down to the bottom of this email, thanks for your attention. and click Update Flow. So now that email will have a little bit more me in it. Likewise, if I wanted to trigger that again, I would simply perform the starting action once again. So that's a quick introduction into Flow. As a reminder, flows are incredibly powerful, not just because of how they replace workflows, but because of how much more they do than workflows has ever done. As a quick side note, when a flow has been created, it can also be shared. From your My Flows view, click on the little people icon, and you can add another owner. So let's say for the sake of argument, you're leaving, or likewise somebody else is stepping into the same role as you, you'll be working in partnership with them. You can share access and ownership of this flow with them, enabling them to edit upload and delete this flow as needed. 
They can also remove other owners if they need to. Go ahead and pause the video. Try building out your own flow and running it. Edit a few things. When the flow works, check to see what you can add to it to make it better. When an existing item is modified, send an email. But also, maybe you'd like to add another condition. Or likewise, maybe you want to say, if something happens, then don't send an email. Like if you edit an item. You don't want to be notified of your own actions, so you might add that kind of condition. It's amazing how creative you can get with this. Pause the video, and we'll see you after the break. Thanks for watching. Don't forget we also offer live classes in office applications, professional development, and private training. Visit learnit.com for more details. Please remember to like and subscribe and let us know your thoughts in the comments. Thank you for choosing Learnit.